It's just such, such an incredible, humbling honor to, to, to be amidst this, this, in, this environment. It's an absolutely delicious gathering. Thank you. This is the kind of work that I do. Um, and the talk is going to be framed in some way on a rather solemn, a, an almost unspeakably solemn sense of architecture having changed and the fundament of the world now being one that trembles, where we stand on fragile ground, where the need to make a built environment is something that is far, far more than an opportunity. The kind of responsibility that we hold is so, so fundamental. This talk will be organized in four sections. I'm going to try to talk about some laws which could be looked at rather differently. I'll share rather quickly some studio works to give you a feeling for the practice. Then I'm going to try to frame that in old and new craft, looking at some paintings, looking at some practices, looking at some very particular methods, including some distributed computational systems. And I hope that'll have some resonance with Tired's practice as well, which, which really underpins this work. And that then, I think, will try to justify some optimism. The sense of laws that we live in are so fundamental. The sense, for example, that we need to make order, that things fall apart, that things flow inexorably from hot to cold, from, from crystalline, precious order to disarray, is something that I think we have been taught and that we assume and that underpins our world. And that creates a very particular way that we design of trying to hold things together, of making things orderly, of, of making things durable. And if there is a sense of something like the second law of thermodynamics, which we understand as saying exactly that, that entropy prevails, that things will dissipate, that things will literally fall apart, not just dissipate, that things will get cold, then that kind of picture in which we make things as hard and clear and tough and resilient as we can, but which inevitably fall, have had a really extraordinary transformation in this century. I love the insights of Ilya Prigozhin, mid-century, winning the Nobel Prize of, of, of 1977, which established that the Earth is not a closed system where equilibrium prevails and where that law, the second law of thermodynamics prevails, but rather that standing waves are all around us the waves of the dunes and the ocean swells, no less than the barred accumulation of, of, of clouds and so many other examples, which suggest that there are tenacious intermediate things which last and which have order. And the recent thinking of people like Gavin Crookes and Jeremy England and other physicists suggests that those standing waves in fact can be generative and that life is quite precisely that phenomenon which surfs and rolls and is continually formed by that open energy. A fundamentally different kind of sense of what the makers of the built environment need to do. Rather than making shells then, which promote equilibrium, the opportunity to make things open and to gather and to serve and to, in, to encourage interchange becomes a very different craft. And that calls, I think, for some rather different practices than the ones that are traditionally taught, at least in Western architecture, about making something optimum, maximizing territory, minimizing the expense of envelopes. After all, the action of making shells and boundaries most certainly creates optimums but inevitably polarizes and excludes as well. So I won't try to explain the following diagrams until later in the talk, but the aspiration of this work then is to include, is to make multiple open boundaries, 
to allow those boundaries to be far beyond a human domain as well, deep into the earth, open into the sky, and to use very particular strategies, which I'm going to try to illustrate, in which rather than making the minimum possible kind of interaction with the world, the most optimal envelope, we seek the maximum possible interaction with the world through deep reticulation and efflorescence. And that perhaps results in a sense of a rather delicious kind of vertigo, rather than the sense that that is nauseating or upsetting or irresponsible to promote. And perhaps that will justify some optimism. I'm going to skip just through a few samples of projects so you can get a feeling for the kind of practices that underpin that, that series of, of rather eth ethical uh, I ideas that I've just pronounced be 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 before I, I share some, some strategies. The, the sense of deeply reticulated, quite large scale, wilderness-like in, in environments that tremble, that oscillate, that expand, that have symphonic qualities, that certainly make places that work for emplacement, but serve as a kind of conversation with multiple dimensions in, in symphonic layers, making open, quite resilient thresholds. Quite a bit of work goes into aligning form languages, morphological systems, a bit like the periodic table in the sense of, of promoting har harmonies and, and multiple affinities between elements so that they can be quite coherent and so that they can make rather immersive in environments. Environments that are certainly unitary and harmonious, but also deeply diffusive and open using forms like manifolds, like reefs, like swarms. Some of them approach being encyclopedias, like this kind of rather ordered <laughs> um, element, and, and some, some, some of them move rather close to crystalline relations as well. And, and in the first day, I, I personally raised a question to Ilya Delio in her own talk about, about the problem of, of crystals and, and cells and how difficult the this, this sense of order can, can be when it, when it reduces itself into those, those rigid geometries. But I hope you, hope you can see the kind of rather open, mongrel, hybrid sense of, of multiple harmonies coming together in this work. And that in turn results in, in work which is invested in couture. That is to say, our own envelopes and the possibility sheath of our dresses and our vestments and how we can be together even just for a moment perhaps not necessarily sit downable. <laughs> <laughs> this work also has, is rather currently moving in, into, into a phase of looking at projected digital twins and possibility spaces in which the deep investment in design systems and plans is now a persistent model which allows that design system to become an ongoing dream which is animated and projected. And so you can see, for example, a single data source here, which both illuminates, rather meticulously pick, picks out and, and, and illuminates, but also projects the possibility space, which, which, which revisits the, the, the design patterns that, ma that made its digi digital fabrications. And so it's dreaming its, its, its own variation, as, as, as you can perhaps see in, in, in the projections of the, of the data space. So this is not the same thing as pure augmented reality. It's not really screen-based. It's a, it's a literal shadow, but there are virtual shadows as well that are, that are deeply coupled. And so this, this experience of perhaps seeing illusion in a rather delicious kind of uncertain space is, is one of the things that, that, that the work practices. So I'm going to run rather, rather swiftly through a series of tools and frameworks that can enact this, this kind of rather sensitive open, deliberately vertiginous way of, 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 of working. The idea that space itself could be reconceived rather than empty space as an, ether, as an ether, as a very deliberate kind of term of fullness. I'm going to try to question Plato rather directly in, in, this, in the sense of the, of the reductive geometry that I, that I was speaking about earlier. And I'll talk about a bit of psychology as well in models of relationships, transitional objects. And I'll dwell on empathetic materials, try, trying to quote, 
quote tired in, in a contribution to, to this, this gathering. I started with a sense of the uncertainty of the horizon, of the fundament. And that uncertainty in my own childhood, I wonder if, if you've had similar experiences, was something that created a kind of an ethic in me in which I was taught to enjoy the, the, the truth of death, the emptiness of space, the decoupling of our world from the sentiment of hope, the kind of existentialism that was in some way proud of being atheist, <coughs> proud of getting to know emptiness, was in my childhood and my upbringing, a kind of beauty. That is, being able to handle reality, that reality is cold, that things are factual, that the space in between those little clusters of planets and galaxies is empty, a vacuum, absolutely empty. That vision of space and then the clear figures which are floating is one that I think is still very, very much with us. The kind of hard-headed, demystifying ethic that so often I think we're encouraged to hold. And if previous telescopes and previous macroscopes taught us that this was true, what a remarkable new vision comes from the James Webb and the collection of, 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 of data in all of the universe, which gathers together that, that evidence and tells us a very, very different story than isolated empty space. When I look at the Grand Bolshoi simulation, the, the kind of tissue-like filamentary prolongations and promises that are spoken of suggests that something rather different than empty space is needed as a conception. I can't really apologize for, for the sense of the sheer affinity, the, the, the anthropomorphizing of it perhaps, I mean, the tissue-like empathy that seems resident in, in the reality of what space is through, the, through the, the, the realities of the mirrors and the collective satellites and the gatherings of new information, the sense of what the universe is, is I think something where new language is very, very much needed, rather beyond the language of humanism. It's kind of a delicious sense, isn't it? That, that, that things prevail and are connected and create a very, very tangible tissue-like surround that enframes us. This then, in turn, suggests that some rather different craft could be used in informing how to make buildings, how to make things, how to contribute to the building, built environment. In the sense that if we make shells, we have a very particular kind of responsibility which limits material use as a, as, as, as a very good thing, and yet somehow creates partial fragments that can't possibly create fundamental renewal in the world. This rather pernicious problem of how to make the most efficient, optimal, responsible things in, in design is one that's been with us for a very, very long time. And, and this talk is pretty clearly standing against the kind of vision of beauty that Leonardo pronounced here recapitulating Vitruvian space, the Vitruvian, the Roman writer, whose firmitas, the sense of durability and responsibility, which underpins the, the entire qualities of architecture, suggests that the, the rather awkward business of, of, a, of a human organism, for example, is inframed by the transcendental, absolutely reductive idea that a sphere or a circle is better, is more true, is more fundamental, is the origin of life. And this lasts in the sense that perhaps even the thought of a raindrop as being the optimal way to build, the, the most responsible, the most exquisitely beautiful, 
lasts, I think, in design culture. I think the fundamental problem is that this is a mechanism for minimizing interaction with the world. There, there can be no less interaction than a perfect sphere, after all, in terms of the amount of material that goes into its envelope, the amount of interchange, the amount of conversation with the world. It's the least possible conversation as, oppo as opposed to something which fosters conversation. And it's very strange to me that in our design culture, we don't favor a thing like a snowflake which is perhaps a fundamentally different mode, which maximizes conversation and is radically vulnerable and, and savors the kind of dissipation of, of energy. It seems very curious to me that this, in a design culture, risks being thought of as vulnerable, self-indulgent, weak, fragile, even irresponsible. This talk then is clearly founded on the advocacy of, of some corrections which, which try to establish reticulation and vulnerability and kind of tenacious involvement as fundamental design strategies then. I want to translate this into a sense that that strategy is not simply formal in terms of expanding and, and fostering transactions but can move into a mechanical empathy as well. By quoting Tired himself, perhaps, in, in the sense that the construction of this collective fabric that we as practitioners seek in being responsible for built, the built environment, seek sympathy. And let me skip through some old paintings that perhaps offer some strategies, at least language for that. I, I love Roger van der Weyden's crucifixion in the sense that there is fabric which ripples and roils and carries this extraordinary kind of sympathetic emotion alongside the human acts. And even, even more pointedly, along with the capacity of the material to resonate with, the, with, with those almost unspeakable stories and acts, the latence of the minerals raining down in the wall as well has a kind of weeping quality, which is quite conscious for van der Weyden, the empathy of the surroundings. In a kind of an essay, which occurred just a few years after van der Weyden was painting, Matthias Grunewald painted the extraordinary Isenheim altar, altarpiece, of which this is, this is a part, this, this is, is one, one of the elements of the, of the Isenheim altarpiece. It's, it's located in Colmar, which is just close to the corner of France, Switzerland, and, 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 and Germany. And in this, which depicts in the Christian story, both the ascension and the Annunciation, we have a remarkable kind of sequence Certainly, perhaps the, the familiar sense of transcendence, of, of dissolving and turning into galaxies and stars, but also this extraordinary fabric which wraps around the body, vulva, blushing, full, full of crimson blood, and drying and curling and turning into, ven in, into venous oxygen-starved blood and moving down into that kind of writhing sense which moves towards min mineral existence and indeed into the ground as well and into deep, deep physicality. I, I love the kind of spectrum where these materials then carry so, so very, very much meaning and, and emotion. I'll just skip through one more example of, of this kind of empathy laden material in Fra Angelico. Paint, paint, painting a, 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 a little bit, uh, well, at the same time as Roger van der Weyden, in, in the image Nole me tangere, which, which, which means touch me not. And this is an image uh, taken from Christian mythology in, in which the, the Christ God has been crucified, and then Mary Magdalene, deep, deep uh, co co colleague, encounters what she thinks at first is a gardener three, three days after the crucifixion, mistakes, mistakes the, 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 the figure for a gardener, and then a, a, a sense of don't touch me and a, and a kind of a shadow crossing the grass as, as you can see occurs. 
The material quality that's in this painting is another kind of example of the mechanical empathy that I'm, I'm pursuing and that I'm, I'm trying to suggest can be seen in the material work that's, that's been made here. In every single leaf of the garden, there's a little red flower and we can see the spot of blood on, on the hand of the god, the stigmata. And we can also see that every single flower is echoing the same act, a kind of a chorus of, of empathy. But the way each one of those flowers is painted is really remarkable as well, in the sense that the paint is blotched, is barely, barely touched, is allowed to fall, as if the material itself is, is handled with such a, an intense reverence that it, that it brings in its own stories rather than enacting human kind of control. This is such a very, very different idea about how art making can speak than the kind of Leonardo proud, let's, let's say controlled clarity that, I, that I, was, I was showing before. It's a kind of release of control rather than an imposition of, of control. A remarkable kind of trust in materials. And I, I just want to underline that this, this is not just an anomaly of, of one single meditation, but it, but it's a, a, it, it exists as a, as a, con, a continuous meditation through, through late medieval and, and early Gothic painting. We, we can see in, in this picture, this, this, this is another Fra Angelico scene in, in which uh, it, it's in fact a, a Madonna and child above, above with, with, a, with a great veil. Um, but the cloud, that holds up these figures is, is made of a similar kind of paint treatment. I hope you, hope you can see that this kind of extraordinary kind of blotch uh, te technique of allowing paint to fall and, and allowing physics to, to speak, the natural world to speak, is, is, is being shown here. To my mind, this gives us such a very different sense of how to work with materials and, and how, to, how to make things than the contro controlled kind of humanist or, or, or oriented mi minimal and en envelope maximal control uh, uh, values that, I, that I've, I've been speaking about. And, and so the idea that in fact we have psychology itself offering where rather than a model such as prevails to our day, such as, such as Maslow gives us, this is, is Abraham Ma Maslow is rather, rather famous hierarchy of, of humans in which maximum ind independence, maximum auto autonomy, maximum responsibility is on top of all the other things. We have, I think, available to us some very different models. And I'm very attracted to Donald Winnicott, the mid-century uh, in English sci uh, child psychologist, who looked at materials not making us independent so that we could be responsible for them, but rather dwelling in the open space in which materials somehow hold our identities. A transitional object that acts as a kind of an intermediate between a mother's body and an infant is one that's perhaps familiar to all of us. All of us had lovies. <laughs> I certainly did. And the way a good parent works with those lovies is not to take them away, not to clean them, not to define a relationship between me and the world, but rather to allow a kind of grotesque, turbulent, fearsome kind of utter ambiguity and vertigo of, a, of an identity in which identity somehow decathects, in which certainly responsibility is found, but a very, very different one than pure control. What I'm showing now is I'm, I'm just going to jump into some, phys some physical examples from, from my, my and my studio work, which tries to act on some of the examples and frameworks that I've just, just shared. And precarity, very deliberate kind of trembling instability is, is one of the qualities of, of the materials, which then translates into a rather delicious kind of immersive quality of, of multiple el elements rolling ar ar around as a scene which run in turn into a rather oceanic sense of touch, of intimacy, of response, of deeply, deeply dis distributed uh, microprocessor systems, which, which are invested with, with, with learning and, and, and response. And, and 
in turn, those are organized by some geometries which are quite deliberately unstable, you, you, using aperiodic systems rather than periodic systems, that, that is, which don't repeat, like the Penrose tessellation and, and, and uh, other, other ge generative systems, turning those then into essays in which things can roll together, like the, like, like the, cell, the cellular constructions that, that start life, unroll, move into intermineral states as well, and have a, a rather happy, har harmonious, rather comprehensive sense in which multiple elements can resonate together, deliberately unstable as well as crystalline and stable. These then get rolled together into rather substantial scaffolds that then get clothed with multiple microprocessors, power delivery systems, actuators, sen sensors, and then they make these kinds of, of environments, which are prototype architectures. That, that is, they, they, they tend to live in, in interiors now, but they're moving in, into envelopes as well. And I'll just skip through these because uh, I'm, I'm gonna wrap up in just a couple of minutes, but you can see some of the kind of, of interactions and the rather deep clothing that, that, that creates this, this rather, rather rich kind, kind, kind of surface, rather deliberately making these open thresholds which then dance and, 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 and work in, in, in rather dynamic comp compositions. Um, underlying those are control systems as, as well, um, uh, which, which, which have layers of, of individual soft software modules, which result in, in a rather happy in interplay in, in which the underlying geometries then are populated and which stutter and play and continually gen gener generate uh, and, and, and make this, this kind of quite, quite lively kind of responsive environment. The computational modeling that informs this is very deliberately ambivalent. And the condition in weather of quasi-geostrophic turbulence, I love being able to say that by, with, with, without you hesita hesitating, <laughs> is the kind of condition in the ocean where the Coriolis effect of spinning and planetary gravity are nearly, nearly balanced, and that produces this extraordinary kind of gentle churn, refreshing itself, making it very possible to build this kind of system, system ourselves and, and, to, and to work with it. So I'm going to sum up now. I've started with a rather solemn sense of laws. I've talked about the pride of atheism and of empty space, and I've asked for a rather new definition, rather new terminology of space. And I've suggested that making shells and making optimal reductive elements is in some, some cases irresponsible. I've tried to talk about very particular craft methods using reticulation and using deliberate precarity as a very substantial way to make a renewed architecture and that moves into a sense of wilderness at times and a sense of symphonic relations. And the quality of looking at things right at the boundary of whether they are real or perhaps our own projections in the state of pareidolia, a kind of vertigo of perception, is one that I think can be a tremendous kind of festival of possibility. So that produces a sense of identity which might be deeply insecure, but I hope that it can also justify some optimism. Thanks.